first stop is Jun Nagami, who is a four-season cyclist, bike out advocate, bike blogger, bike dad. He teaches in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at the University of Toronto, where he is also the faculty advisor for the Human Powered Vehicle Design Team. So please welcome John. Well, thank you, man. Boy, always a hard act to follow. So anyway, um, just by way of introduction. Um, this is me. I'm a four-season bike commuter. I'm a bike dad, a bike advocate. I spend way too much time on Facebook posting under the name Joe Koga, and also I have a bike blog. But anyway, I'm not going to talk about any of those things tonight. What I want to talk about is, since the theme is limits, I want to talk about how fast you can go under human power. Now, I'm an engineer, and so let's put some numbers to this. So what do I mean by human power? Okay, an elite athlete like Usain Bolt, you can think of him r roughly equivalent to a cordless drill. Depending on the model that you get, you can get anywhere from about 350 to 850 watts of output power. And just to put some perspective on it, one horsepower is equal to 746 watts. Okay, so that's how much power we have to play with. Put that elite athlete on a bike, and let's say we've got a professional level sprinter, he might be able to put out 700 watts for four or five minutes, and that's just enough energy to lightly brown a piece of toast, okay? <laughs> so that's what we have to work with. Now, we all know that the bicycle is one of the most efficient ways of converting power into locomotion. So the question is, how fast can you go on a bike? So if you Google the term world's fastest cyclist, these are the things that you get. Oops, sorry. Here we go. So this guy here went down the side of a mountain at a little over 100 miles an hour. Of course, he's sponsored by Red Bull. <laughs> and then even more impressive, Denise muller Coronet went just under 184 miles an hour on the Bonneville Salt Flats behind a fairing that was towed by a top fuel dragster. Unbelievable. But neither of these things is really under purely human power. I'll have a little bit more to say about Denise later in the talk. So, uh, last summer I was in a bike shop, regrettably not this bike shop, and I was surprised to see these two postcards. And so this one we all know about, Bike Month, but this one was advertising something called the World Human Powered Speed Challenge. So for a week, every September, people travel from all over the world to this little town called Battle Mountain which is in the middle of the desert in Nevada. Now, why would they do that? It just so happens that State Route 305, just south of town, is long, it's straight, it's at 4,000 feet elevation, and it just happens to have just under two-thirds of 1% downward slope. And that's the maximum that's uh, allowed by the rules governing this type of event. And that makes it the fastest track in the world to set land speed records for bicycles. There's the finish line there. I don't know how that prompt got in there. <laughs> anyway, so a little bit, little bit about the history of the event. So it's been running since the year 2000, and for much of that time, the world's fastest man was this guy, Sam Whittingham. He's from Quadra Island, which is a little island off the coast of Vancouver Island, and you can see that he, he went pretty fast, okay? now. Um, aerodynamic drag is the thing that holds you back from ultimate speed. So that's his bike. It's called the Varna. It's a streamlined recumbent bicycle, and that little bubble on the top is a head bubble, and there's a windshield there, and that's what Sam uses to, to peer out of the bicycle. Just to give you an idea of, the hit, uh, of how the event has grown over the years, here's a picture from 2011. There's Sam. Beside him, Barbara Boitois, a woman from France. She also rides a Varna world's fastest woman at 75 miles an hour. Okay, and then here's the uh, picture from this past fall, and it includes the crews and some of the volunteers that run the event, but you get the idea that the event has grown tremendously over the years. Okay, so uh, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a video that was put together by a couple of U of T alumni a couple of years ago to give you a feeling for what it's like to run a bike down this course, but I'll just remind you, the bikes, oops, sorry, 
The bikes start at start, they're launched there. They have five miles to accelerate. Excuse the Imperial units, but we're in Nevada. They're timed over 200 meters, and then they've got about a mile to slow down and to catch. So we've got start, acceleration, timing, and then catch. And that's the sequence of events you're going to see in this video. Now, the state-of-the-art bikes now are camera bikes. The, the viewing is done with a video camera that eliminates that windshield and the head bubble, which makes it more aerodynamic. <laughs> so that was why she, well, at the time that this at the time that this video was made, the uh, world record was 83 miles an hour, just a little bit faster than what Sam went. You can see in this wide shot, you can see the chase vehicle that's following the bike at a safe distance. He's jumping up and down. Yes! 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 <laughs> oh, man. Oh, sick. He's fine. He's fine. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. He went five miles in just under five minutes. Nice. Are you good up? Yep. I <laughs> oh, that looks good. What's the deal? <laughs> and then we have Todd Reichert. He's the world's fastest man with a new world record of wow, 86.65 miles an hour. So it's always very exciting to see the bikes go down the course. Okay, so Bike Minds is supposed to be about personal stories. So what's my connection to this event? Well, the first thing is I've been going there since 2011. And as you can see from the traffic on my blog, this, it spikes every September when I'm reporting from Nevada. So that's the first connection. The second connection is that U of T Engineering has been sending a student design team every year, and I've sort of attached myself to them as their faculty advisor. Um, here, are some of the, here are some of the vehicles that they've developed over the years. Here's ACE as their first. Vortex was the first one that they used computer modeling to refine the shape of the bike. Blue Nose was their first camera bike. And this one here is called Ada Prime, and it's very, very similar to the bike that you saw in the video. And then the other connection I have uh, with the event you might have been able to pick up from the video is that I am the chief timing official for the event. <laughs> so what we do is we time the bikes over a distance of 200 meters to a precision of a thousandth of a second. And the other thing is these things here are wind meters. A run doesn't count if the wind is over six kilometers an hour. And so I also have the pleasure of announcing the speeds at the racers meeting after every session. The racers, of course, know roughly how fast they've gone, but they don't know if the wind, if the, uh, wind was legal during their run. And I've had the pleasure of uh, announcing many, many world records over the last 10 years. So what happened last year? Last year was an exceptional uh, year for racing. Uh, the highlight was uh, the uh, race for the women's record. So the women's record set by Barbara back in 2010 was a little over 75 miles an hour. And then on Monday, this woman, Rosa Bas from the Netherlands, broke that record. And their team from Delft and Amsterdam were absolutely ecstatic because they had been gunning for that record for three consecutive years, and they finally got there. Unfortunately for them, by the end of the week, they had been beat twice by two other women, uh, uh, Vittoria Spada from Italy, and Ilona Peltier from France. And Ilona is only 19 years old, oh, wow. and she went an incredible 78 miles an hour. And then just as a side note, uh, Denise muller Kornick, the uh, person behind the dragster, she also showed up, admittedly not on the fastest bike, and she went 70 miles an hour. So that gives you sort of a, an idea of how much more difficult it is to go fast when you're not 
behind a top fuel dragster. So anyway, that's what happened last year. It was very exciting. What is going to happen this year? So the absolute speed record is about 144 kilometers an hour, just about 89 miles an hour. And that's held by Todd Reichert, the guy that in the video, he came back the next year and raised the record to 89 miles an hour, which is an incredible four miles an hour faster than anyone else has ever gone. Okay, so how can we beat Todd's record? Well, one idea is more power. So, this past fall, this thing showed up. <laughs> it's called the Sprocket Rocket. It was, it was built by a bunch of crazy aerospace engineers from Southern California. It has five riders in it. Each of them is pro level, and each of them can put out a thousand watts in the sprint. So they had 5,000 watts to play with. Guess how fast they went. Any guesses? 96. They went, up, huh? 96? They went 56 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly, raw power isn't going to do it, right? It's ha efficiency has something to do with it. So U of T also built a multiple rider bike for the first time. They call it Titan. It has two riders in there. And the bike wasn't really quite finished by the time of the competition, but they did manage to get it down the track. And they set a new tandem record of just under 75 miles an hour. And I guarantee you, we're going to be much, much faster this year. And then finally, one of our rival teams, the one from the Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands, they've also announced that they're building a tandem as well. So it'll be very interesting to see who has the fastest tandem in the world and if any of us can go 90 miles an hour. Well, not me personally, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so anyway... That's it. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And if you have any highly technical questions about the bikes, uh, Calvin Mose is in the audience uh, right by the projector. He's the former captain of the design team, and he's the lead designer, builder, and rider for our tandem bicycle. Anyway, thank you very much. How fast were you on the Brompton? <laughs> uh, we were just doing that for fun, uh, so we weren't we weren't timing that. Uh -huh. <laughs> what is your what is, what's your personal speed record? My personal speed. Oh, that's a very sad story. <laughs> I have I have crashed several times, and I've never managed to get a two wheeler down the course. I did get a three wheeler down the course, and I went. 49 miles an hour, which is not very good. Anyway, yeah. what, what tires do you use? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, if you want a detailed discussion about that, uh, our new tandem uses 700C tires. Most of the other teams have special non-production tires. We're using the fastest production tires that we can find, and they happen to be by Vittoria at the sort of speeds that we're running. How wide? They're, uh, they're, I don't, well, how wide are they? I don't remember the calendar. Uh, 28? I think they're 25s. Yes, yeah. okay. They're not that narrow. Yeah. Clinchers? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah they're clinchers, yeah. Because they're, like, doping? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I don't think we're, I don't think we're that serious. I mean, I have, I have observed that a lot of the racers are pretty hopped up on Red Bull. And, and one of the racers that uh, I won't mention was caught huffing pure oxygen before he climbed into the bike. But anyway, yeah. I mean, it's a serious issue. There usually isn't enough ventilation in the bike, and CO2 buildup in the shell is a real, is a real issue. Yes. Uh, thank you. This was fantastic. I'm just back to the, the bicycle running the toaster. So are people looking at how do we harness all this power and energy? Well, I, I think that's more uh, a point of appreciating how much energy you're actually taking for granted that's coming out of the wall. Mm -hmm. A human can't, can't, can really barely, a world-class sprinter can barely um, uh, brown a piece of toast. And that's something that we all take for granted. So the, the theme for this is, you know, the future of transportation is trying to use as little en as energy as possible and still being able to go as fast as a normal car could on a highway. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, Ryan. Um, 
All the records are set in uh, Imperial, yet most of the competitors are not American, and even the timing is not done by an American. No. Is there any reason to do that besides the location? No, we, we I mean, the history of the event, this is an American event originally, and, and, and one thing is that starting at 50 miles an hour, which is just above where I went, you get a hat, and every five miles an hour above that, you get a different color hat. And these are the most <laughs> coveted things. And that's why, if we've all seen what the 85 mile an hour hat looks like, there's only one person that has it. Uh, we all want to see what the 90, 90 mile an hour hat looks like. Yes? Is there a competition for people riding a bike without like the, the dome features, or mm -hmm. like is there other classes well, so there are, there are classes for single rider, multiple rider, there's a trike class, and there's men's and women's in each, and there's also several junior classes. But there isn't anything that says uh, it's single rider, but with a windshield. Uh, pretty much all of the teams, the fastest teams, have gone to cameras now. Yeah. Yes, Peter. Do you think there's like a theoretical limit? Like it was nine miles Well, I, I mean, We've done some, ca I, what limits us on this course, I believe, is, is the amount of distance we have for braking and the amount of kinetic energy that you can dissipate. And I think that probably mid 95 miles an hour is pretty much at the theor theoretical limit of what's manageable on this course. If we had a longer course or one at higher altitude, then you could go faster. Or a hybrid too, uh, just a two. Yeah, but that's that building a hyperloop tube is a little beyond the budget for this. <laughs> <laughs> how dangerous is this? Like, how many injuries happen? We've, we're extremely fortunate that there have not been any any serious injuries. Um, this event, they make the course as as safe as possible. All the little uh, markers that are normally metal have been replaced by Nevada by plastic posts. We have very stringent rules on cars parked anywhere near the park, I mean near the track. Uh, at, um, but in the reality, the first time there's like a death or serious injury, the event is over, basically, yeah. I think, I mean, I don't want to, one more question, yeah. Okay, um, how do the athletes train? Like, do they train in those dome bikes or do they train on regular bikes or like how does it work? I think I think uh, they they usually train outside of those. But you can ask Calvin; he spends a lot of time training on a, on a regular trainer, but in the recumbent position because that's the position that he's pedaling in. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much.